Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let to Be Talk. Today is Monday, July 17th, and this episode is brought to you by my fantastic motorcycle sponsor. You know and love them. It's been over a year. They've been sponsoring this podcast. These guys rock. It's El Cajon Harley. Hell yes, it is El Cajon Harley. You know you need two wheels. You need a Harley Davidson. It's summertime. What are you doing? You've been waiting all your life to get a bike. Go do it. You can get finance. Go on their website, ElCajonHarley.com, and fill out the uh, pre-approval right on the website. Or spin into the shop and test ride something, man. Go in there and ride yourself a Dyna or maybe a Road King or a Breakout or a Sportster. Anything. Get your ass on two wheels. Come on. Don't be foolish. It's motorcycle season all year round in Los Angeles, so there's no excuse that you don't have two wheels. Splitting lanes, getting to where you need to fucking get. Forget about that traffic. Get on a motorcycle, a Harley Davidson from El Cajon Harley, located in Southern California. I don't care where you live. Fly into San Diego. My boy Greg Riley will pick you up, and you can ride home. You'll never forget it. Sturgis is coming up. Get your ass to Sturgis. I'll tell you what, I've been many times, and uh, it is epic. You want to do something in your life that you'll never forget? Ride to Sturgis. Maybe get your bike serviced. A lot of people don't sleep on getting your bike serviced. Don't be like uh, dicking around. That's only two wheels. Get some new tires or, you know, get your brakes checked, uh, oil change, anything you need. Also, Elko and Harley has all kinds of cool shit like bikes, bands, and bikinis First Saturday of every month. They also got the Padres ride to Petco Park July 16th, which just happened, so that doesn't matter. (laughs) And, uh, oh, they're giving away some Metallica tickets. Go on their website and find out about that. Giving away Metallica tickets. That's going to be smoking. All right, guys. Elko and Harley. Follow them on Instagram, Twitter, and um, Facebook. into a little bit of the episode here it's uh, i just walked into the door from uh grand rapids michigan and detroit and uh it's funny to think uh you know it never gets old to me man going to different spots and seeing uh seeing you know people that love the podcast it's, it's just amazing i was out there in grand rapids did this crazy venue Opening for Bill Burr, which thank you so much, Bill. Cannot thank that guy enough. He has just been a fucking, just a lifesaver in my comedy career. I love that guy, and he is a a complete inspiration. To get to watch him do hours of comedy, I just learned so much. So not only do I get to open for him, but it's like being in, you know, comedy college. Just sitting there watching a fucking master up there slay these people in a boiling hot incinerating room it was blazing in this place it was an old church i think it was built 19 or sorry 18 1864 or 68 right around then and it looked exactly like if you saw king diamond on the last couple tours it looked exact to king diamond set you can look at it in my instagram dean del rey and see what this place looked like. It was fantastic. I just came out there like, you know, tonight the circles meeting again. <laughs> just merciful fate in it. It's so it's something so crazy about doing just dick jokes in a church. <laughs> I just up there like, yeah, man. It was awesome, and the people, all the people that came to the shows, wow, just phenomenal. No assholes in the crowd. That's what, I learned something over and over, uh, you know, going out and working with like Joey Diaz or Marin or Burr. When you have your own audience, it's just phenomenal. Because, you know, when you're just doing a club, 
you know, like say the comedy store and you're popping in or whatever, there's different peoples from all around the world and they, you know, they might not know who you are, but they know the next comic or, you know, whatever. But when you have your own audience, man, which I learned on uh, Sunday night in Detroit, I was doing a rock club. Shout out to Cat and everyone at Smalls in Detroit. This place was amazing. They hit me up. This is some guerrilla, guerrilla uh, booking and, and some, uh, some next level. I love this kind of thing. The, uh, she follows me on Instagram. She books this club, Smalls, rock club, famous rock club. And she was like, hey, I see you're going to be in Grand Rapids. Do you want to spin up to Detroit? on the Sunday, and headline here. It's a rock club. And I was like, yeah, fuck it. Let's do that, man. And I'm so glad I did it. It was a room full of uh, room full of just people that listen to Let There Be Talk and, of course, that have heard me on, like, Rogan or Marin or, or Joey Diaz Church of What's Happening. It was a room full of those people. And my point is, Although there was, you know, a small group, and, you know, of course, burrs are huge, you, you realize how great it is to be performing in front of people that know everything about you. I could go on these, you know, journeys. I could take the audience into some storytelling. I could riff. I could talk about things from the podcast, and they know what I'm talking about. And it was just absolutely, it was one of my favorite headlining shows I've ever done. And, and everybody that was at the gig, holy shit, were they cool. Heavy music fans, heavy comedy fans. Those two together, man, make for, uh, I realize, an, an amazing audience. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, uh, Grand Rapids. Thank you, Dr. Grins and Stuart Huff for letting us drop in on your show um, on Friday and Saturday. Uh, after the sets at um, the Fountain Street Church, Bill and I on Saturday went over and, and popped in at Dr. Grin's Comedy Club, which is just so cool. It's, it's great for me because you're doing a giant, giant venue and then boom, get yourself grounded, get yourself right back into the fucking club and uh, don't get delusional. Keep working and, uh, you know, that's what it's about. Anyway, fantastic weekend, and thank you, everybody, that came out. I love all you guys. Uh, my guest today, it could be one of the uh, all-time, all-time dream guests for me. You know, uh, I remember 1981 or 82. I've told this story many times. I was in the record factory in Santa Rosa, California. It was the one underneath the uh, 101 freeway. Uh, I walked in, there's a woman working there, her name's Kat, she managed uh, uh, a lot of local bands, and I said, what's happening? She's like, you gotta check this band out, and she handed a, a, a piece of vinyl to me, and on the cover, it just had a fucking guy in leather pants, just a crotch shot with fucking spike belts, and handcuffs, and a, and a, a fingerless glove, and, you know, and I'm looking at it like, this looks cool. I turn it over. I go, whoa, look at these fucking guys. I remember I went home. I popped it on, came on. It was like, plug me in. I'm alive tonight out on the streets again. I was like, fuck, I'm in. I'm in. From that day on, Motley Crue was deep in my fucking blood. Went and saw him at the Santa Rosa uh Vets, scanners opened. That was Jim Cassera. My memory is working good today. Jim Cassera from uh, Vicious Rumors had started his own band. We were friends. He goes, come down. I sat on the stage. I took some insane photos of Motley five feet away. There they were. Just, I mean, these guys were fucking rock gods, man. It was crazy. You know, you got to think you had Van Halen. And, and then, you know, for years, you're rocking Van Halen, you're rocking Judas Priest, Scorpions and all that. And all of a sudden, here comes the fucking new kids on the block. And they're taking fucking names. You know? And then, 
a masterpiece called Shout at the Devil comes out where I see him at the uh, war field and I meet some long lifetime friends, Fernie Rod and Billy Rowe from Jet Boy. And we had dreams to start our own bands. From then on, man, I saw Motley pretty much every tour. Saw him with the, uh, with the girl drummer. Uh, saw him at the, what, the war field when Tommy Lee just got out of jail. Uh, Fillmore, I saw him at. I've seen him huge. Oakland Coliseum. Cow Palace. Saw him at the, uh, you know, Day on the Green. One of the all-time biggest, you know, uh, 80s rock festivals ever put together it was motley white snake jet boy and uh someone else i fucking spacing it right now but anyway i saw the band many many times i've always loved them i even saw them on the farewell when they signed the contract at jimmy kimmel i was there standing on the stage thank you don barris for setting that up yeah motley crew fucking great I'm one of those guys, if anybody said different, I'd be like, get out of your fucking mind. Listen to these songs, they're so great. That Shout at the Devil, Too Young to Fall in Love, Hollywood, uh, of course, the title track. All the records had something. They changed their look over and over. I was constantly like, holy shit, now they're like girls. Oh, now they're bikers. Now they're fucking clean. What's going, you know... I, and then they drop Dr. Feelgood, and that thing is just a smasher. I could talk on and on and on about them. Let's just get into this, but uh, I just wanted to give you a little rundown of what, how monumental the guest is to me. And to be friends with Nikki Six is just insane. We are going to do this interview um, a while ago, and the morning that we were scheduled to do it, Chris Cornell had passed. And neither of us were in the mood to talk. So uh, I, was th- I just thank God that it uh, got rescheduled because I know Nikki's completely a uh, busy man. Check out his show, Six Sense. If you've never heard it, you must be sleeping under a rock. Uh, I was on it last month, Six Sense. You could go to uh, Nikki's uh, page and, and just listen to that right there on the page. I want to thank him one more time. And I want to tell you guys, before I do kick off the interview, yes, I could have asked him a thousand questions. And yes, I could have interviewed him for four or five hours, but I'm not the guy that writes down questions. I just let a natural conversation go. And uh, that keeps it organic and cool. Believe me, I had a hundred more questions. I wanted to know, did Tommy Lee's crazy drum kits come out of the fucking band's pot. You know what I mean? Did they try out other singers other than Karabi? When they were uh, looking at singers besides Vince who came in, what was it like playing with Blackie Lawless? Yeah, I got a million questions. And hopefully I'll do a part two. But if not, thank you for uh, just sitting down with me once, Nikki. Before I get into it, some upcoming shows here. Toronto, you're next on the Road Rash Tour. I'm coming your way. Uh, Let's see. July 26th through the 30th, I'll be at the corner with Red Band and um, Sam Tripoli. August 10, 11, 12, I return to the hometown San Francisco with Joey Diaz. We'll be at the punchline. Cannot wait for that. September 6th, Brea Improv. I'm headlining one night only. Get your ass out there. And what else do I got? Oh, there's a gig in November 2nd. I will be with Bill Burr in uh, uh, Iowa at the uh, place where Buddy Holly played last. I fucking should know the name of that, but I don't right now. This episode is brought to you by my Rolex sponsor. That's right. Rolex is sponsoring the podcast, St. Cross Rolex. They are the official Rolex dealer. Don't go to any of those gray markets. Get your watch at an official Rolex dealer. St. Cross in Koreatown. How cool is this, man? I love watches. They have all kinds of watches other than Rolex. Also, they have Panerai and and a bunch of other brands. But Rolex are their specialty, and they have every model in there. Daytonas, Submariners, Sea Dwellers, uh, Sky Dwellers, Datejust, 
to 8840s. All my favorite watches. I love them all. Go see St. Cross. Uh, ask for Andy. They are on Western Avenue. Go down there. Koreatown, an official Rolex dealer. Get that five-year warranty. Don't go gray market. Don't buy your shit on eBay and not be able to sleep at night. Get your watch at St. Cross. Let's get into it right now. It is time for the man, Nikki Six. You look good. Oh, thank you, dude. You look healthy. I've been fucking... You know, I quit sugar for like... It's been 14 months now. That, that's that's my drug. Yeah, me too. Fuck I mean, heroin. Yeah, it's brutal. You know why? Because we've been doing it since we were one year old. You know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah, you do drugs whenever you start drugs. But it um, when you start those drugs... It, it, it's like way later in your life, maybe 16, 18 sure. or whatever, but, but cereal, milk, yeah. everything has Quisp, sugar in it. Quisp cereal. You're not old enough to know about that. Yeah. Quisp cereal. I would just die if I didn't have my Quisp cereal. It was like a little uh, saucer, like a little, and there was like the, on the box was like a little alien. Yeah. His name was Quisp. Yeah. And he rode around in this uh, sugar you know, sugar ball, sugar, uh, spaceship. And I just let them all fly into my mouth. And now I'm a sugar addict. Right. <laughs> there was one when I was growing up called King vitamin, zero Whoa. vitamins in it. Look at that. King vitamin. King vitamin. And what about like cocoa puffs? You're like, okay, like it. count chocolate is like, that's like some cool stuff. Count chocolate, cocoa Booberry. puffs, booberry, yeah. frankenberry. Yeah. You're like, if it, ha- if it was cool. Yeah. Then you would eat it too. Oh, God. I ate the shit out of that. I, and here's the thing. Not breakfast. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Oh, yeah. Like my mom would come home with food and I'd be like, can we just have cereal? And I would eat cereal. <laughs> That's so rotten, right? <laughs> God. You ever try quitting sugar? Um, No. I've tried to cut back on it. Here's what I noticed. Yeah. Um, I had this experience the other day in here. I... I judge my life on my pee. So uh, like, I went in the bathroom, I pee, and it's bright yellow. And yeah. I'm like, I took my vitamins. I am, I'm on the right track. Finally at 58, I'm on the right track. I'm taking vitamins now. But also, my yellow pee bubbled up. You know why? Because late the night before, I had a visit to the freezer. <laughs> and had some Ben and Jerry's. Oh, my and God. And the sugar makes my pee bubble. Yeah. And that tells me it's not good for me. God. You know, I, I say. Yellow bubbling pee. I say in life, a God or whoever you believe in, I think they let you fuck around your body with two items and, and you can live forever. Like, you know, like my grandma smoked and drank all her life, lived to be 99. But, you know, she never fucked with candy, you know. No. But like Jerry Garcia did heroin and cocaine forever. And then Ben and Jerry's comes out with that ice cream named after him and boom, he's dead in a couple of years. <laughs> it's <laughs> you the know sugar. I mean? Yeah, greed. You got greedy. Yeah, it's Sh- shit sugar is Satan. I know. So you what's know. it like to kick it? Well, you kick dope a few times and you know what that's like. It's the same thing, man. Mad body aches. Yeah. Severe uh, body sweats. Okay. M- night sweats. Okay. Wake up in the middle of the night like Whoa, yeah. Full rushes, yeah. like and uh, and complete depression, like a massive crash of like, oh fuck! How man. long is that? Like, did you wean off or you jumped? Yeah, off? I jumped off. Of course you would. Yeah. Right. So then, 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 like, how long does that last? What, what's day one like? Eh, I got it. Day one, you don't even notice. I don't really. care about the sugar stuff. I'm gonna kick its ass. Yeah. Day two. Day two, you start kind of like you're at the store and you look down, you see candy, and it starts drawing you in. You're like, fuck, I need some candy. Look, you got- I, can, I can do this. I'm stronger than you, yep. Mr. Butterfinger. Yeah. I and mean, day three? Day three is when I, uh, is when it starts kicking in. The sweats. Same same, same with like same dope. With dope. Yep. Right? You're like, I can do a couple days. I'm hurting. But day three, it's like, eh, maybe I'll just do a little bit. Yeah. I'm going to just a little chip. Yeah. Chip. Yeah. yeah. And I'll be okay. I'll just chip, and then day four, uh, I'll I won't do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're all starting to back over, you yeah. know. So what's day five and six like? That you know they were all horrible for right. like three weeks. Three weeks. It wasn't That's like strong. it wasn't like it just went away. You yeah. know what I mean? Like cigarettes or dope, it's out of your body in a few days. Yeah. 
This is way more planted deep. It, it's a, it's psychological. Did you watch your body change quick? A man, I in a matter of uh, about a month, my yeah. face changed shape, and I didn't even really notice it until a guy took a picture of me at the podcast studio, and I posted it up, and they went, "Holy shit, you look way different." Yeah. And I looked at the photo, I go, "Wow, my face had shape." Yeah. You know, it was. A I tri- saw something you posted on Instagram the other day, and you uh, you hashtag Fat Dean. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Just owning it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, I was, I was like, I never thought of you as heavier. Yeah. You know, it's weird when we're on stage, you know, uh, and you and you look at band guys and you go, oh, they're all fat now and stuff. Yeah. And you and you often wonder, you go like, well, they're rich as shit. Why don't they just have like their own chefs and right. everything? But there's so many demons in your mind. You know what I mean? Like as you quit one thing, you start another. I've got addiction in my body. So when I quit, you know, uh, sugar uh, then it's shopping. You know what I mean? Like, okay, now I got to yeah. fill this hole. And it's some kind of dark demon. I know it, you know? And uh, I just sit back on it. When I got really clean in the late 80s, uh, around the Dr. Feel Good time, I, I had that same experience where I just like, I got addicted to working out and I loved it. And I would see people and they'd say, whoa, dude. And I'd be like, what? And they're like, you literally don't even look like the same guy. So you go from being young, you can drink and do everything. And then all of a sudden, you know, I got, my manager said I had bison head. My <laughs> head even got big. Yeah. You see people say like their heads get big. Yeah. I don't know what, it's like inflammation. In it's eyes. all sugar. Yeah, it's all sugar. From booze, you know? So there you look at it. Booze, like, man. I had the worst hangovers. Yo, me too. Me too. I drank the fuck out of booze, you know? And uh, so you're, if you're drinking booze the whole time, then you're eating like shit. Yeah. I'm 51, and I'm in better shape than I've ever been in. You know what I'm saying? What about, like, after you, like, got hammered, you had that hangover, you're like, I'm canceling everything today. I'm on the couch. Yeah. I'm just... Which was your go-to food? Because I, I have a shameful go-to food. Mine would be pizza every pizza. time. I'm not happy with that. I need a better answer. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, I would, I would just eat pizza, yeah. like, to try to, like, soak up all that yeah, booze. Yeah, me too, soaking up. Mine was, like, it's, like, really bad. Or Ida tater tots. Oh, my God. That's a specific thing. I know. I mean, I was, like, really a bad alcoholic, and I would yeah. bake them. I don't even know. I, I didn't even know I knew how to bake. Yeah. My demon said, bake these things. They will <laughs> absorb. And then I would take mayonnaise and tobacco sauce and I would mix it up for a sauce and I would yeah. put Lowry's seasoned salt. Why don't I even know about this? Satan is a powerful thing. It really is. And I would soak all that up. And by about eight o'clock at night, someone would call me, hey, dude, you want to like, you want to, you know, go out tonight, you know, chase some girls and stuff. I'm pretty hungover. By 8.30, I'd be go. hey, let's meet up. Let's totally. Let's have a couple shots. Yeah. Or Ida Tater Tots, save me. <laughs> <laughs> you should do an ad. <laughs> I should. <laughs> or Ida Tater Tots. Yeah. The best hangover food on earth. You, you, it's it's crazy to think about, like, uh, like your band was definitely geared around uh party you know like yeah. being dangerous and outlaws and uh and that was how life was supposed to be is rock and roll you know what i mean you're supposed to live fast die young as the corny thing goes but you know after that vince thing with razzle mm-hmm. it's pretty interesting to think like i mean that is like whoa game over right yeah i mean isn't it weird? Do you think it's weird that he would keep partying later on? I mean, God, that's like a, a wild fucking demon there. I mean, I had overdoses and yep. I kept doing drugs. Right. Tommy flipped cars and kept doing his stuff. You know, um, the only smart guy in Motley Crue is Mick Mars. Wow. You know, and to say this is a smart guy in Motley Crue is funny. That's like when someone goes, Nikki, man, you're the brains behind Motley Crue. I go, is that an insult? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that that thing, whether it's sugar or alcohol or drugs or pussy or shopping or obsession over anything, it's it's a hard thing to to get your arms around 
and wrestle it to the ground. Yeah, it really is. It and really I'm not is. judgmental. Like when Razzle died, I remember thinking to myself that like it, it wasn't funny anymore. Right. And, and it blew my mind. Like I never thought one of us or one of our friends could die. I mean, we talked about it. Yeah, man, I'm gonna like die young. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna yeah. be in the 27 club. You know, all these stupid things you say in interviews. But then when somebody really dies, you're like, damn, dude. Like I'm used to death now. I'm 58 years old. Like a lot of my friends yeah. have died, and a lot of my heroes are dying. And you get to the place where family members die, but we were young. Yeah. I was in Martinique, uh, a little island with Niels Lozauer yeah. and Robin Crosby. And it was, I think, one of the first times I ever went on a vacation. And we were down there. We were having so much fun. We went to uh, a Club Med. Oh, yeah. I never even heard of a Club Med. So all you can drink, all you can eat. And it was a, it was a French island. So all the girls uh, were Naked. topless. Yeah. And I'd never seen that unless it was in the back of the tour bus. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, this is heaven. I'm moving here. I'm going to I'm gonna invest in Club Med and quit Motley Crue. This is the yeah. best there was. People would come up to us on the beach, sell us weed. We were doing shots. We were, like, taking the sheets off the bed, making pirate flags. We're playing guitars. I remember I wrote uh, uh, Keep Your Eye on the Money and Louder in Hell in Martinique. Wow. And Robin Crosby's like, that sucks. Oh. I go, your band sucks. He goes, your band sucks, you know, because we were buddies. Yeah. And uh, we flew from Martinique into Miami, and there was Vince on the cover of a magazine, uh, not a magazine, but a newspaper. Oh, wow. We didn't have so cell you didn't phones. know, no cell phone, no emails, no, none of that. Wow. I mean, there was nothing. I, I How many been, days after it uh, happened? It had only been like a day. Whoa. So I went from like paradise, like the, one of the, peaks of my life i'm with my best friend yeah. with a, one of my buddies great photographer we we for the first time don't have money problems we got girls we got drugs we got alcohol we got food we're, we're in the sun it's like life is great well let's get back to reality i wrote a couple songs yeah for an album you know theater of pain and i remember going to a payphone, and i i don't know what to do i, I gotta collect call Wow. To the office. And I, I called Doc McGee and I was like, what happened? And they told me. And it's just like, I remember that flight from Miami back to Los Angeles just going like, I was in a trailer in Idaho with a poster of Aerosmith on the wall. And now it's over. And, wow. and, and, and someone's dead. Like, and Vince, like, what's Vince going to do? Is Vince going to go to jail for the rest of his life? What this... What's this this family of this 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 guy that I might have only met Razzle once? Right. Um, it was mind blowing. That's just, just I remember that because it was just kind of like, oh well, they're done. Right when yeah. it was just fucking like the, the just, I mean, we're huge. Just, we were just we made it into the playoffs. Yep, we made it into the playoffs. Everyone's like, this band's going to go. They're going to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah, and and there was so many mixed emotions because as a as a as a dreamer, you're like my dream's over, and as a human, like you're struggling with that. So it's like, are we mad at Vince? Yeah. Are we sad for Vince? Are we? What are we? And and we're just as bad. We're drinking and driving ourselves, and so is everybody else. Everyone on was. planet Earth. Yeah. I mean, I remember being in a car with Blackie Lawless and Tommy. And uh, I had gotten my first money uh, publishing check, and I took all of it. I got six thousand dollars. Yeah, and I found a a, a nine fourteen Porsche. Badass. It was exactly the publishing money. Wow. So, so to pay for it, I had to call my grandparents, who are dirt poor. So I need money to cover the the registration. <laughs> so I got that car. I had nothing. I had nothing, but I had that car. And man, I was like in a band with a Porsche and my buds were all in bands and the chicks were crazy back then. And we were driving down Sunset Boulevard. I was driving. I was doing over 100 miles an hour. Yeah. By three o'clock in the morning. I had a bottle of Jack. Blackie had a bottle of vodka and Tommy, I think, had a bottle of gin. We got pulled over. 
and cops pulled us over. We got out. We we're all in black leather. Yeah. The T-tops off that thing. And cops just said, man, what are you guys doing? Because you guys are like going way over the speed limit. It's like, sorry, dude, we're going to a party, man. Oh, fuck. Like, that's our brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then. yeah. Yeah, he's that's like, Hollywood, too. Like, what, what is that stuff? And we're like, well, you know, it's just some drink stuff. You can't drink and drive. Pour it out. They poured it out, made us walk yeah. to the garbage and throw the uh, bottles away. And they said, you guys, you need to go home. And they and they gave us the keys and we went home. I remember the same thing. But dude, what are you talking about now? Oh. And then also, just right after that, Vince, you know, gets in this horrible accident. And, you know, not only did Razzle die, but two other people were injured. Yeah, the car he hit. Yeah, bad. Yeah. So... It was a big, it was a big eye opener in a lot of ways, but not enough to stop everything dead in its track. Yeah, that makes me feel a little sad. Yeah, yeah well, it's uh, you know, it's uh, it's an addiction. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it, like, how long have you been clean now? Sixteen years. Sixteen years, no weed or anything. You don't Mm-mm. do weed. Mm-mm. Sixteen years. No, a bunch of my friends uh, that that are sober have. You know, they're like, I just need something. And they're like, you know, so they like start vaping weed. Yeah. Like they don't really want to become weed heads, something to take the edge off. And I'm like, I can't do that. Yeah. I'll just be like, be like just going right back in the sugar aisle and getting that Count Chocula. Yeah. Next yeah. thing you know, I've got, I'm doing Captain Crunch breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Weighing 490. This thing you know, I weigh 490. I'm in a $300,000 Ferrari. I'm on Sunset Boulevard trying to relive the heyday, <laughs> and I'm drinking with a Coke straw up my nose. Yeah. And I, you know, crash into the Playboy Mansion building, and I'm dead. That's a <laughs> yeah. hell of a way to go out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's weird. Once you get to a certain certain age, you kind of want to live, right? It's yeah. weird. Yeah. I like, I want to see where this goes. Yeah. Like, I, I say that all the time. I'm like... Man, I go, I can't wait to be like 80. I'm going to have like a lot of gold teeth. I only got one so far. Yeah. I got I got space for two more. <laughs> fucking covered in tattoos. Yeah. I'm be fucking eccentric. Uh, guitars, cameras, grandkids, just crazy artwork. Yeah. Just blowing through life the way I want to blow through life. Maybe I'll have a pink Rolls Royce with a skull and crossbone. I'll wear sunglasses at night. <laughs> and the eyes will be so bad. Like, yeah. they'll be super thick for reading. Coke bottle sunglasses. Yeah, Coke bottle sunglasses, man. And I'll just, like, I'll wear my guitar into the clubs. I'm going to go clubbing at, like, 85 yeah. with my sunglasses. No shirt on with a Hawaiian shirt and leather pants. Stink eccentric fuck you i'm alive yeah i do anything i want now absolutely right now i'm on the line yeah I'm you on look the... great 58 58 yeah you look yeah. fantastic I feel pretty good let me ask you something about that last night of the crew tour it's almost two years now right yeah it's uh i guess it'd be a year and a half yeah, right yeah because right? it was new year's eve yeah uh and then I, I remember reading something where you said you guys didn't even say bye to each other is that real uh yeah, yeah. yeah was, Any uh, communication with the guys now at all? I've uh, I talked to Vince. Me you do? Vin, me and Vince, t- you know, talk and text back and forth. He's a texter like me. Yeah. And uh, I've reached out to Tommy and Mick a couple times. I uh, and I'm got any anything back. You know, like when it ended, man, it, it didn't end in a good way. Yeah. Uh, we're all in different ways, but you know, like as like the time went on, I was like, I'm just gonna reach out because like we were like there together in the beginning. I, I don't want to reach out and put the band back together. Right. I was just like, hey, man, just like, you know, reaching out. In fact, Mick, I reached out to because it's crazy. I always wanted to have one of Mick's guitars. Yeah. And like he has this white Stratocaster that I just love. I love everything about it. And I'd say to him, dude, like, you know, like, you know, can I buy it? And he'd be like, no, man, I only have one. And then, and then like, you know, as the time went on, I'd say, I'd see you have another one. Yeah. And I go, can I buy that one? He goes, oh, I only have two. And then, you know, I found out that he was getting them custom made from Fender Custom Shop. And I was like, great. Can I like get the number? I'm going to call him and get one. 
And uh, he's like, no, man, they, they, they don't do that. And just, you know, time goes on. After all these years, towards the end, I remember that, like, towards the end, I said, man, I want to, you know, get get one of your guitars and, like, I'll give you 25 grand for it. Like, I'm going to buy my own guitar right. player's guitar. I don't care because he's Mick Mars. I got a tattoo of him yeah. on my leg. I mean, I carried him out of his house when he was dying and I spoon fed him. I spoon fed him to keep him alive. Took him to doctor's appointments every single day. I mean, we didn't even know what was wrong with him. Right. And, you know, he's one of my favorite guitar players in the whole world. And a lot of crazy people have said a lot of stuff to other band members. And there's a lot of weird lawyers involved. I had to sue some people to make them step back. And um, I, I never got that guitar. And I remember uh, talking to a friend of mine. And I was like, oh, I was so bummed because... Wanted to be like that. That's not only did I get it from Mick, but it it would be like I love that guitar. I love the way it sounds. I love what he did to it. He's got the humbuckers in it. Yeah, uh, the way it's relic. Uh, the, the everything about it. The size of the headstock. So no, this guy made me a Mick Mars replica. That's crazy. He made it for me, and I'm so happy with that guitar. I took some pictures, and I was like, "This is for Mick." Wow. You know, and then fans are stupid on like, oh man, if that's a Mick Mars replica, you should give it to Mick Mars. I'm oh. like, no, no, I got it because yeah. I couldn't get the real one. Yeah. I'll give him the replica if he'll give me the real one. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, trade. But, 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 I, but I love that guitar, you know. What's it like to play in a band with dudes that you don't really talk to? What is yeah. that like? Because and that was a long run. And, and here's the thing. You got to realize that when these four guys got together, we we agreed on a common idea, right? And everybody put their skin in the game. Um, I don't think Mick Mars was a punk rock fan. Right. I'm a punk rocker at heart. I always have been. My attitude is I love heavy metal, but I was never a super musician, muso fan. Right. I'd be like, I love what Eddie Van Halen's doing right there, but I didn't think about it technically. There's other guys in the band that are technical, so they put their skin in the game. I put my anarchy in the game. I'm a huge lyricist fan, and that's like my driver for everything. And nobody in the band wrote lyrics. I wrote all the lyrics for the band. That was all the messaging, and Vince had this voice. No one else sounded like that. He had a Spitfire Gatling gun like lead vocal style, he put his skin in the game. No one played like Tommy. Tommy was 17, 18 years old when I met him. I was a monster, and he was hyper. He's a hyper human being. He played hyper, and I played simple, and that worked. If I played super busy and he played super busy, yeah. it wouldn't have sounded right. So he had that. I, I feel like Tommy's energy was a big driver of the band. So you have all these guys, and all we do is we, like, do what bands do. You know, it's like we write songs and we play gigs and it's like we're high-fiving each other when that hot, super hot chick wants to do two guys at the same time in the yeah. band. You know, it's like it was something that we will never experience with other human beings and I don't know if anybody will ever experience that because it's 2017, not 1981. And as years go, each guy meets a girl and they say, "That's that's I like that girl. I'm going I'm to keep her around. Uh, that that girl that I'm with can't sleep with the other guys in the band. Yeah. That's I'm, I am not even going to tell anybody what her vagina looks like. That's when you like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, man, what's it like down there? Oh, man, you know, yeah. I don't know, man. So Dude, that's anyway, my lady, man. Hey, do uh, you want to get a hamburger? No, what about that chick the other night? No, no, no. You're like, oh, you must like her. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you so must all, like her. So all of a sudden you got four guys that like girls. And then they like live with them. Yeah. So all of a sudden we're not like like dogpiling each other at eight o'clock in the morning when everybody's hung over and like eating McDonald's for breakfast because we stole money out of a girl's purse. Yeah. And she's still passed out in the bathroom. Um you you become like you own a home. And like guys move in different places. Yeah. Like one guy lives over here, one guy lives over here and um all of a sudden, like you, you, you do things like make dinner where before you used to eat dinner at a restaurant and dine and dash yeah. together. And then if the waiter caught you, you beat him up. Like, <laughs> yeah. like good luck. 
Yeah. Good luck. You yeah. caught us. Now, now, now yeah, we're going to yeah. fuck you up. Now you're fucked, dude. Yeah, you shouldn't have ever chased us. Yeah. Next time we go in your restaurant and we eat, you're not even going to chase us because you know we're going to kick your ass. Yeah. And that mentality changes because you grow up. And that's a natural thing to grow up. And 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 musically mature, and next thing you know, it's like Nikki. What do you got? Da 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 da. Go like this. Da da shout. Da da shout. Like Tommy's like whoa, ba 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 ba. And like Vince is like, why is there so many lyrics in here? I got, I got something to say. Yeah. Lyrically, yeah. shout at the devil, and he's like, <laughs> okay, man. He spit fire and that stuff. And p- next thing you know, we're at the grocery store. It's like, um, dear, would you like zucchini or? Squ- uh, squash tonight with your <laughs> filet mignon. The outlaw and, goes away. Well, I mean, the outlaw's in your heart. Yeah. But the men start to be come like family oriented. It's not a gang anymore. And yeah. And it's like, so it's a gang in rehearsal. It's a gang in the studio. It's a gang on stage. And man, you put Motley Crue on stage, even we hate each other. Yeah. If you stood in the front row and you flip Vince off, I would jump in the audience. I would beat your ass. Wow. And Tommy would be right on top of me, like at you too. That's how we, and people would go, these guys won't talk to each other, but if you fuck with one of them, if somebody kicked in Tommy's dressing room, I'd be the first guy there and shank him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and they're like, these guys are fucking sickos. They don't even talk, but they will beat your ass up if you even say something bad about the band. And as the years went, Tommy wanted to be a different guy. Yeah. Right. You know, I saw the different phases with him. I remember, I remember when he first got out of jail, you guys played the Warfield and he was full on hip hop guy. Yeah. yeah. He fell in love with hip hop. Yeah. Which I I get, you know, but I I have no problem with it. Right. But it was weird for us. We were like, whoa, where's Tommy? Yeah. And, and then he went through kind of a, I don't know what that other industrial kind of EDM guy, Yeah, EDM guy. And, and, and anyway, so, you know, he's uh, young and he's exploring. Yeah. But Tommy's thing was like, well, wouldn't it be great if Motley Crue did this? And then my thing was like, I want Motley Crue to be Motley Crue. So like if if I'm Angus Young and I'm like, here's a song called Highway to Hell. And then Tommy's uh, Malcolm Young and comes in and goes, hey, man, wouldn't it be cool if we sound like these other bands? Angus is going to say, no, what are you crazy? Yeah. And then there became resentment. And it felt like, oh, Nikki's holding the band back. I wanted the band to be Motley Crue. And Tom and Mick is passive. You know, we did some albums with this producer named Scott Humphrey who made Mick feel horrible about his guitar playing. And it was like about, you know, all sampling and all this and all that. And so, you know, Mick started to kind of pull out and Vince is in and out of the band. And at, at times it would be really wonderful with us. But here's the bottom line. I have nothing bad to say about anybody in the band. Because like we all wanted something in the beginning, right? And later we all wanted something different, and 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 just because I wanted it to be the same thing, and somebody else might have wanted it to be a different version of that, doesn't make them a bad person, right? Uh, it just means it was time for us not to be a band anymore. Yeah, I get it. Because taste change. Taste you know change. I mean? You know, like if you look at you know, like I always tell people, you know, yeah, Motley Crue, one of my favorites of all time. But does that mean I love the whole genre? No. No. You know what I mean? And 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 I did when I was young. But as you get older, you go, oh, well, these other bands were just, you know, whatever. I call, I, you know, it's look, you get a really nice meal and you get like, you know, that, that stuff on the side and, and, and you, you take it off and put it on the table. You know, it's like, a, you know, garnish. Yeah. I think some of these bands that were coming out in every era, you're like, oh, man, look at this. It's amazing. You know, you've got, you know, Motley Crue and you got Guns N' Roses. And, and what's that? That's that's God's trickster. Put, <laughs> yeah. that, put, that on the, put that on the table. Yeah. I'm not going to eat that. Yeah. That's that's a taste bad. Why'd you put that on that? Why'd you put that on my plate? You say to the waiter and the chef and they go, because it makes it look pretty. Yeah. I don't care about pretty. I was, I'm hungry. Yeah. So, you know, music changes. People change. It's okay to change. It's okay to be dysfunctional. It's okay to, um, it's it's okay to let it go. And you know, I haven't gone in the press or anywhere and talked bad about anybody in the band. And I, I don't think that I need to do that. I I think that my frustrations in Motley Crue probably equal other guys' frustrations in Motley Crue. But when you boil it all down, you ask me if I've talked to anybody in the band. I reached out because it's like, hey, man, like, you know, how you guys doing? That's yeah. it. Like, back to that first day in rehearsal, 
Like, you know, I don't really care if, you know, Mick Mars wants to fly from the fucking Eiffel Tower with a fucking flame torch playing fucking Stevie Ray Vaughan licks and, and you know what I mean, in a fucking push-up bra. Yeah. It's like, great. That's not why I'm calling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I don't need anything. I'm not calling you because I, I, I'm going to try to incentivize you to do something. I am just was just like reaching out, you know, but when it first ended, I, I wasn't reaching out. Yeah, man, that's... So I'm just softening a little bit. My my AA sponsor told me once, said, you know, when you really got the program, it's when you learn to let things that are hard soften you. Yeah. And I was like, wow, man. It's like, I was like going through a divorce, and I was like, I oh, man, break lines over a cliff. I'd be so happy. Be done with this divorce. She'd be dead. And he's yeah. like, whoa. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just got to let, like, what went wrong actually be a life lesson and soften you a little bit. So for your next relationship, for your next bands, for your yeah. next shows that you do, for your next whatever. Was there ever going to be a whiskey show at the, uh, yeah. at the, uh, never, it was just circulating well, Vince, rumors? I think Vince said something. He's like, right. wouldn't it be fun? And, and, and Vince did mention it to me, and I was like, I go... And, and and I did. I, I knew what he was saying in his heart. He was saying, that'd be great. Like, we'll go play the whiskey. But, you know, I saw it, and I told him this. We're going to get off stage at 1 o'clock in the morning. Right. We're at the Staples Center. Yep. So we're going to pack up all of our wet clothes, and we're going to somehow get everything up to the whiskey. You know, I'm sure we'd have a second set. Yeah, just set an up. SIR shit set up. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to blow in about 3 o'clock in the morning. And we're going to be dog-ass tired because that was a long day. The last show, I mean, we we had some more filming and interviews and stress and the last night and all that family and hundreds of people on the guest list wanting to say hi and goodbye. And I just said, I don't know if I want to end it, like being like, I can't wait to go to sleep yeah. when I'm playing Livewire. And he's <laughs> like, yeah, I know. It just would have been cool to go back and... I, I understand. Like, you know, I remember I had this one idea before the tour. I wanted to and actually make a T-shirt. Uh, I just wanted to do Motley Crue uh, Hollywood tour. And I wanted to play uh, a Monday at the Troubadour, a Wednesday at the Whiskey, a Friday at, like, uh, the Roxy. Wow. You know, just I can do all the, in Hollywood, maybe do a night at the Viper Room. That would have been just, amazing. And just go and, and just, like, play a bunch of different songs and, yeah. you know, and stuff. But like, that was my idea. And the band was like, yeah, you know, Vince had ideas. Tommy had ideas, you yeah. know, and, um, it, it became four men with different ideas. Right. So sometimes you have a band and you go, there's four guys with the same idea. Metallica. Yep. They were like, this is what we are. We are metal. They it's figured even in it our out. name. Yeah. Figured it out. Even though they had some crazy albums here and there. Yep. Figured it out, and towards the end, I think our version of figuring out was let's just let's like leave our legacy for what it was, you know. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to record our first song we ever recorded together, "Stick to Your Guns," yep. as the last song, re-record it, make it the last song we ever did. I mean, thirty. That'd be sick. sick. Full circle. Full circle. But you got four guys. And one idea. Yeah. So it's okay. See, a lot of guys would sit here and go, those guys, man, I wanted to do this, and those guys are stupid, and that guy was ugly, and that guy, yeah, yeah. That guy was drunk, and that guy was fat, and that guy's <laughs> dumb. He wanted to be, want, that guy wanted to be electronic. Nicky's a stick in the mud, man. He didn't want to change. Yeah. Like, you know what? Why don't you just let it be cool? Like, it was what it was. And you know what's cool about Motley Crue? Dysfunction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The danger of it. Like I At watch any this, time, it's going to explode. It, well, I never knew. Yeah. We sometimes only made three songs. Yeah. And many times. And the band would blow up on stage. Um, I'm watching the show called Animal Kingdom. Yeah. That's Motley Crue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was Motley Crue. Like, they're a family, yeah. but they're dysfunctional. Yeah. Well, you had a singer... And I, I, I described this about Sebastian Bach. You pray for a complete lunatic outlaw, yeah. and then when you get him, you try to tame him. You know, I've talked to Skid Row guys before, and it really comes down to, again, the fact that you are uh, not 21 years old, 
and you have a home and you have a wife and everyone in the band, they've, they've, uh, they've got, they've got what they want, but they also want a little bit of peace. I don't want to wake up every day to fucking drama. Yeah. I don't want drama every fucking day of my life. I'm so happy that Motley Crue made a decision to move on because there's no more emails about things that you're like, we can't even agree on the goddamn artwork. Unbelievable, yeah. It's like, fuck, dude. It's artwork. Yeah. Like, you guys win. It's 2% smaller. <laughs> I mean, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but, but it becomes about other stuff. But like with, with Skid Row... I don't think they want, they just, they're just like, dude, if you could just sing, yep. but you can't. That, it comes down to that, because if you got a guy who wrote all the songs, but he get to get zero glory for it, like you wrote all the songs in, uh, in Motley, but you got all the glory, but if you didn't, it would kind of ride you a little bit, right? Like if, if Vince was the focal point of right, the band, but right. he never was. In your band, all the guys were the focal point. Right. Songwriting. And see, and see, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and this is the thing. I don't know who wrote the songs in Skid Row. Yeah. I just like the band. Um, a lot of people don't know who wrote the songs in Motley Crue. Motley yeah. Crue is a, is a band that will be on the radio and streamed and be heard in movies and and talked about. Yeah. You remember that band? That drummer flew upside down. The bass player was shooting fire at him and he died. Yeah. No, did that happen? Let's go to Google. Yeah. Did Tommy Lee died. Nikki Six killed Tommy Lee. That never happened, idiot. Pass the ketchup. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm trying to say yeah, is folklore. Yeah. It grows and it grows and it grows, you know? And and I think in in general, People get so hung up, man. I don't care who writes song. Right. Like, if it's a good song, I'm going to play bass on it. At what point do the guys in the band start saying, hey, I want to write songs? Because you're writing, the first two ra- records are complete masterpieces. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and then you got to get that, that becomes a friction because of publishing and identity, right? Like, I, hey, I, man. I don't think it was ever about publishing or identity. What was uh, it about? Just it, artistic? Uh, no, I just think that people like learn to write songs. When when we started the band, I was a songwriter. I yeah. wrote songs for other bands. Before I was in a band, actually, uh, there was a band uh, in uh, Burbank, and I used to work at this uh, factory, a steel factory. And one of the guys worked there, and he had a band. They played in a garage, so I hung out with them. You know, I had a I had a bass, but I wasn't in a band. And uh, I wrote all the lyrics for that band. Wow. I was like Bernie Toppin. Just Ghost Rider. I was ghost. I just wrote them and gave them to them. And they wow. were like in the garage spitting out my words. I'd hang out. And I never even, I don't even know whatever happened to any of it. They probably don't even know that. Yeah, that you're famous. That like, famous. They don't even know it was the same dude. Yeah. That's amazing, right? They got like some Nikki Six originals. Yeah. <laughs> they could just record them right now and go, you gave them to me. Yeah, like mid-70s. Make a little bit of money. Mid-70s. Wow. Uh, my God knows my wife sell everything that's, uh, you know, mine. It's like, if I fucking, if I, if I, if I was a girl and I was on my period, they'd be selling my old tampons. <laughs> I like look on eBay. It's like Nikki Six nose hairs for sale. <laughs> like, that's nice. That's really fucking nice. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it became about people, you know, in, in a band when I go, here's this idea called looks that kill yeah. and everybody puts their skin in the game and does what they do. Tommy does what he does. Mick does what he does. I do what I do. Vince, you're like, that's cool. We go play it. People go, that's cool. We record it. And then one day somebody sits there and goes, you know, I got this idea and I'm going to bring it to the band. <clears throat> I'm going to bring it to the band. I got this song idea. It's great. Like if there's four guys and two guys have ideas, yeah, that's less work for me, and better shot that we're going to have more songs and some diversity because one writer might write in one style, and um, the guys and Vince never, but Tommy and uh, Mick and mostly Tommy because Tommy's into recording, right? So Tommy like build in and program stuff and building stuff, and you can see where that ended with him. He's like really into being in the studio and loops and. You know, yeah. electronic music and stuff. But, you know, he was coming up with lots of ideas. He wrote Home Sweet Home, right? Ta- the way Home Sweet Home came together is I wrote the the part that's on piano. 
I wrote that on guitar when I was 17 years old. Wow. I've been playing that and playing that. I don't know what it was. And we were leaving a rehearsal one day, and there was a piano. And Tommy would always sit down at the piano. We we're leaving. We we're at SIR. And I said, dude, can you play this on piano? Ding, 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 ding. I think I just sang all the young dudes, but whatever. It's You get the point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Tommy goes, ding, 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 ding. I go, oh, that's cool. You know, I'm a dreamer. And I said, my heart's a gold. Vince, come here. That is something, something told, old, bold, gold. I don't know. Give me a piece of paper quick. Yeah. Mick, hold on, dude. Come back. That fast. Sorry, doing. I'm on my way. On my way. I'm going to think, what's that thing in that Aerosmith song I like? Home <laughs> sweet home. <laughs> and, and it was that. And Tommy like wrote the piano part. And then I can't remember who all wrote the parts. I wrote the That song came together really fast. And we were like, we were leaving SIR. I think we were going out to do something. And uh, we were like, man, that could be like our dream on. Yeah. And it was. And it was fun. I remember always because Tommy would play it. Tommy would run in rehearsal. Back to the drums. Yeah. So the piano would be on one side, like down on the floor. Yeah. And then the stage would be there, and the band would be up on the stage. He'd run up, jump on his drums, bump, 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 bump. Yeah. That's uh, that, that, that tune's a smasher, man. I, I heard it yesterday. Yeah. I, I, it's funny. Like I, That song's played a million times on the radio a week, yeah. man. I wish we'd recorded it better. Like, you know, we, we actually had a producer that said, we're going to record this sonically better. Right. But I don't think we... Kind of like a November rain? Yeah. I think it's it pretty could, big. Ne- yeah, it needed to be yeah. you know, a little bigger and stuff. But like a uh, great example of Tommy is Tommy was like programming all this stuff and he had this thing, uh, um, shout, shout, shout. And he, and he came over to my house and he played it and I go, it's a little close to the other song. <laughs> and he's like, I know, I just like the idea. And I go, I was just reading this book, Primal Scream, Scream, Shout, oh, yeah. Shout. I go, let me just roll the bass in here. And he's like, yeah, dude. And then we were like working on it. And I was like, bam, tsh, A, tsh, A. And I'm like, something, something like Joe Perry would do. And Mix like started playing that thing. I go, remember when I saw you? in a bar band and you're playing slide can you do wow wow like on the slide yeah and then a lot of the lyrics i was just reading that book by arthur janoff and i was like oh here's the lyric here's the lyric wow and then i was like kind of going through this thing with therapy where that's why i was reading the book about my mom and dad so the song ended up being about my mom and dad wow yeah that lyrics easy for you yeah well, that was the only hard part for me. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I could write the shit out of tunes. But... You're you're a comedian. Yeah. And you're fast. You could write lyrics really fast if you did this one simple thing. Shut the fucking critic off. Yeah, you, you're right. You you're don't right. Do, you don't do it on stage, do you? No. When you're on stage, do you go, I wonder what that guy over there thinks? Yep. You don't give a fuck. You no, just no. go. And, and, and sometimes I bet you stumble. Your tongue gets tied. You forget what you're going to say. But do you stop? No nope. fucking way. You just keep going and going and going. And my theory is big ass piece of paper and I just write nonstop, nonstop. I keep writing. If someone starts talking, I'm like, shut up. I don't. What are you writing? I don't know. Right. I don't know. You know, and just and channels through you. You just go and you just start writing. Sometimes you look down and you go, I'm the dumbest guy on earth. No. I'm the dumbest guy on earth. But sometimes you go, oh, that one thing. That's great. Let me do it again. I'm going to start with the one thing. Yep. And then sometimes if it's like uh, a line and I like it, I'll put it in the middle of the piece of paper and then I'll start again with stream of consciousness. Yeah. And when I hit that line, I'm like, what are you doing? You're in my way. I got, well, I'm going to jump off you then. (laughs) And you have to trick yourself. Yeah. You have to trick yourself. Another great trick is to surround yourself by inspirational things, minor antique books. So if I have bo- books around me, I will be going, 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 and I'm like, I'm, I, I'm, my brain's going, oh, man, 
Uh, they're not going to like this. Oh, man, this radio is not going to play this. Oh, man, my wife hates me. Oh, shit, my dog just took a shit on my new shoes. Oh. <laughs> it's like, fucking give me a book. I open it up, and I point to a piece of paper, and if it says spaghetti, yeah. I'm fucked. Because oh. I have to use spaghetti as the next word. <laughs> yeah. If it says forever, or if it says in the darkest pit of your soul, I'm like, in the darkest pit of your soul. Yeah. Darkest pit of your soul spaghetti no darkest pit of your soul and you start going from there and you, the idea is to never allow yourself to actually breathe you wow. have to just go and, and not think and think man that's the worst thing you ever do to yourself is think you think about when you're playing you're gonna make a mistake you're making love you think about it oh i should do this oh i should do that just stick your dick in it and go and when you're writing lyrics, yeah. you just gotta stick your dick in and go. <laughs> and same with songwriting. I'm not a great musician, but I will not stop. You wrote the fuck out of some great songs, man. I Thank mean, they're you. classics. I uh, we talked about the S Festival a lot when I was on your show, and I've I've come to the conclusion I want to try to do a, a documentary on it. You know, it's like my my goal now. But my other dream documentary is uh, Oak and Coliseum Dan the Greens. And I remember, Fuck, I, don't, I hardly remember that. Eighty-seven, man. Yeah. It was one of the greatest Dan Greens. It was you guys on the Girls, Girls, Girls tour, White Snake on the huge record, Poison, Jet Boy, and uh, there was somebody else on that. But that was like, to me, that was kind of like, of course you had the big record, you know, Doctor Feelgood. But to yeah. me, that was felt like this is the peak of the scene. Right. And the sound and everything. We're yeah. in Oden Coliseum, 60, 70,000 people, girls, girls, girls tour, and uh, White Snake's peaking. Uh, you know, uh, Poison's got a huge. Did was, we headline? You headline. We did. Okay, yeah. wow. Well, you're going to love this. Yeah. yeah. I love how, you know, man, like to me, it would be the show I talk about still to this day. Like, yeah, did you know I played 60,000 Day on the Green? I mean, you played huge crowds. Right. But that was such a crown jewel. Zeppelin's last been, show I've in been, America. I've been freebasing for three days. Yeah, freebasing. And I didn't sh didn't show up. You didn't show up? Didn't show up. No one could find me. Oh, that's right. You guys didn't go on for like, you went on super late. Yeah. Like we we're waiting around. So they had to find me. Yeah. Where were you? I was burrowed in to the heroin house, freebasing, and they had to basically kick my door in. Yeah. They put me in a limo, right? They took me to Van Nuys Airport and put me in a private jet. Wow. By myself. Whoa. Flew me there. To a very pissed off band. Whoa. Like, what the fuck is going on? You're shooting up again. I go, I wasn't shooting up. I was free basing. Yeah. <laughs> it's different, dude. It's different, I'm man. I'm chilling now. I'm not doing that shit anymore. <laughs> free basing. And uh, I remember, like, just being so fucking out of it on stage. Wow. And I flew back in that jet because you got to pay for a round trip. Yeah. Alone, and I just remember being alone, flying through the night after playing that crowd, and going, "My band hates me. I'm, I'm. This is a bottom for me, man. It's like, why would I do that to my fans? Why? It's like something to be proud about." And I just like remember just flying home in the jet, and I went home the same night. It's like I walked in, and the fucking doors fucked up. And, oh fuck! And I was just like. I, that that was like getting towards the end, man. I was like, this is stupid. Yeah. 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 That is... So like a lot of people mention Day on the Green and, and I'll be like, I, I didn't really remember much about it. Wow. What a bummer, man. Yeah. You know, I, I'm Fucking the same idiot. way that I, I took mushrooms at that show. Well, we were in the same place. Yeah. I remember it was just- You should have come by my house first. <laughs> <laughs> I did some free basing, you know, and I never, uh, it never grabbed me. Uh, like the first couple hits were great, but the next day I was never like, I got to do that again. No, me neither. Me yeah. neither. I had a girlfriend that liked the free bass. So she'd be like, you know, she'd be like cooking up some bass and I'd just be like, oh yeah, give me a hit of that. And then I'd be like up for two days. Yeah. But it was never like, I'd never like think to myself, Hey guys, want to get together and bass? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a weird thing. It, it takes a lot of work too. 
so much work. I mean, and just cooking that stuff up. And you know, I'm not a good cook anyway. Yeah, the bacon soda combo, and you I, fuck it up, and you'd lose blow. I lose like two grand. I know. Like, fuck, we just lost blow. And I'd be, I call the dealer. I go, I need, I need more blow. My dealer, yeah, like was the best dealer on earth. It was he a Hollywood dealer. He was a Hollywood dealer, not the best, the luckiest. Really? Yeah, because I'd just be like, hey man. You got ten grand worth of heroin on my way. Wow! And like you know, and I would do stuff like I would take ten thousand dollars to the heroin, and I would like put them in bindles, like like methodically, like from this amount that I'm on now all the way down to day thirty. Yeah, and I'd be like, okay, on day thirty, I'm going to be able to get off of this heroin. Wow! And he'd go, okay, man. And then day four, I'd call him. You got another ten thousand dollars of the heroin? Oh fuck! <laughs> Ten thousand dollars. Guys came over. A bunch of my buds came over, and a bunch of chicks, and we just did all the junk. I'm, I'm gonna start over. Wow, man! I started over a lot. What What got you into shooting up? Like, I never got into it because it was always like that's the that's the like nah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I I did all the drugs, but to shoot up, it was just kind of like I don't know. It was just like this is this is. It felt wrong to me in a weird world. Of That's like, probably why I did it. You yeah. Know, the first time I ever shot up was with Robin Crosby. Oh, really? Yeah. We. Uh, I lived in an apartment on uh, Coldwater Canyon, and so did he. I lived on the second level, and I, it was a. Uh, it was like a one room with a loft thing at the top. There was a sink up there, and uh, and and I put a bed up there. Yeah. And then just this room downstairs, and then Robin had just a room. Down below, and we were great buds. We were best friends. We did yeah. everything together. And and uh, he knew this guy named Smog Vomit. Smog Vomit. <laughs> Smog Vomit. The band called Texan the Horseheads. Oh, I know Texan the Horseheads. Okay, so oh, Smog, straight junkies. Yeah, straight junkies came over, and uh, they were friends from I believe San Diego, and came over, and um, we would smoke that shit. And I remember a guy's like, "You want to try this?" And I just looked at the needle. I said, "Fuck yeah!" And I did it, and I. I uh, threw up on myself and passed out on my floor and I woke up and I was just like itching and I felt like shit Whoa. and I was like, that's awesome. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. It's like to me, my, you know, guys in my band would be shooting up and I was just like, man, that's just like, I would trip out on it. It was yeah, just it's, hardcore. It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting, interesting thing. You know, I, I associated it with the same thing I associated with like, Hell's Angels, Vagos, Guns, Knives, Heavy Metal, Punk Rock. It's all the things I love. Yeah. I want it. I want, I want a car that goes too fast. I just wanted everything. And I never had any real roots. I, I only got roots when I grew my own roots. Yeah. I, I became my own tree. That I didn't have a mom or a dad or a, really a family. My grandma and grandpa, yeah, but... It was really, I felt a little bit like a tumbleweed my whole life. Yeah. So it's like shooting up. Hell yeah. Can I drive and do it too? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I would just do stupid shit. I remember this girl, she was in this band called 45 Grave. Her name was Dinah Cancer. And she wow. Had, yeah. She Dinah, had, Cancer. Dinah Cancer. What a name. <laughs> and she had a coffin. And I used to fuck her in the coffin. Wow. And shoot up. Wow. It was great. Can you fuck while you're on dope? I never, you know, I never you know, Todd, you got your... Because Coke know. is just, it's done. You got your moments. Yeah. You got your moments. You get that Coke dick, it's over. Yeah. You know, now they got like Viagra. So dudes can just do oh, Coke. Oh, you do Coke and Viagra together? I've, I've never done it. Days. You know, I remember when Ecstasy came out. <laughs> Me too. And I just remember, I'm so mad. Like, why couldn't that come out? There's so many things that came out. And yeah. I was like, why? Why? <laughs> why did I only get like Coke and heroin? Like, but those are the st those are the ones that stuck around. The I, other I know, you know they're the mainstays. They're like steak and you know yeah. the vegetables and potatoes. But then they came out with all this other these special sauces, <laughs> and people would be like, you know, anytime you make music that only goes do 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 do, you need do. some shit. Yeah, and you have like a hundred thousand people all going. This is the greatest moment of my life. I go. Have you heard what jo uh, what Joe Perry plays on Rocks? Fuck. That album. Like, are you you want to go back to do do 
do, can we talk to Mick Jagger for a second? Do, do, that's why that drug was invented. Yeah. To yeah. fool the masses into that. That was great. <laughs> that is good. Yeah, yeah. That's Hypnotic. a good that's a good idea. We're gonna create a festival around this, and three hundred and fifty thousand people are gonna stand there and go do do And do, you don't have to do. learn any instruments or write any songs. No, you can just like grab a couple things, move them around, and if you put a mouse head on, you're like the kiss <laughs> of like DJs. Yeah. Oh, that guy's cool. He's got a mouse head. <laughs> <laughs> I know we sound like old men now. <laughs> Way old. It's funny, man. Yeah. And now, here's what I wanted to ask you about was uh, I'm a huge car guy, and you're a huge car guy, and also uh, motorcycles. So you ride anymore at all? Or no? That's long over? I mean, um, you're the reason, like, one of the reasons I was like, girls, girls, girls video. Yeah. I'm like, that's the dream. I'm going to get a record deal. I'm going to have a Harley, and every night, I'm just going to ride to the rainbow. Yeah. That's all I wanted. Yeah. Ride to the rainbow. Yeah. That's a good dream. And Yeah, and just fucking do drugs and uh, be up and down the strip. That was yeah. the dream. I, I almost died enough times on a motorcycle. Uh, I had a bike that was built for me by the Hells Angels, and uh, the chain locked up. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, I, I just remember it was before the helmet laws, and and I, it, it it gave me that that weird moment where I went, oh, I didn't know that you were right there, Mister Pavement. Fuck yeah! And then a bunch of guys like I knew, you know, Billy Idol got hit. Yeah, and this guy we used to ride with me and Tommy used to ride with the Angels, and this guy Stu. Um, out in Thousand Oaks, California, had a uh, motorcycle shop and leave it to Tommy Lee and Nikki Six in like this really nice area to find the only m- motorcycle shop where the Hells Angels hung out. Yeah. So there's me and Tommy. Yeah. Going back to our mansions. Yeah. With our pretty wives. But in the daytime, we rode our motorcycles and hung out with the Angels and we'd ride with them all the time. They'd protect us. Wow. They'd ride in a circle around us. Uh, there was a ride that they asked me to go on, and I couldn't for whatever reason. Me and Tommy rode up to San Francisco with them, camped out. I really love motorcycles. I yeah. love motorcycle culture and the music. They're good people. They're yep. good fucking people. Totally. Man. And uh, th- this ride was happening, and Stu decided to go around. There was a truck going slow, and they were out in the middle of nowhere. And decided to go around. And when he went around, uh, a, another truck came and hit him head on. Whoa. And like he evaporated. Wow. And and I just remember going like, you know, I think it's time to start uh, driving convertibles. Right. Right. I miss my motorcycle. Yeah. I mentioned to my wife one of those three wheel ones. Oh, and yeah. She told me I'm Spider? not I'm not allowed to get that. Oh, you're you're my joke. Where, where <laughs> I, every time I'm at a gas station, a guy comes up and goes... Ah, uh, nice bike. I would have one of those, but the wife won't let me. You know how it is. And I go, no, I don't. That's my bike. You know what I mean? Like, I love when people, like grown men, will just tell yeah. you how their well, wife Well, my, my wife doesn't care if I ride. In fact, right. recently- Oh, she doesn't want you to have the three. Really. She doesn't want the three. She goes, yeah. if you're going to ride, you're going to get a you're gonna get a chopper again. Oh, I like that. Um, But no, I thought about the three-wheeler thing, because I'm like, I could have like- The like, tunes? My-, my uh, yeah, my o duels in yeah. there. O duel. You drink o duels sometimes. Really, it makes yeah. me bloated. But, yeah, <laughs> you know. But sometimes, you know, I just it make me feel like, wow, I'm on the freeway. I'm in the 101. I'm riding with a beer, and I'm playing like "Get Your Wings" by Aerosmith. Yeah, and I'm untouchable. And then my wife said, no, because you're, you're in a three-wheeler. You're, you're, everyone's going to go, is that Nikki Six in a three-wheeler? I go, I could get the helmet with the spike, and I could paint that thing black with, like, skull flames. Hilarious. Um, I could have the loudest exhaust. I could have a sound, I about a $100,000 sound system on this thing. Yeah. I will crush sticky fingers. Just bam, everyone on the freeway is like, look at that badass. She goes, no, you're on a three-wheeler. Yeah, you're on a, you're a trike. You're, You're on, on a, a trike. trike. I go, but look at those badass guys. And she goes, all those guys are really old. Yeah, yeah. And I go, I, and she goes, just stick with your Jeep or get a real bike. You got a Jeep. Yeah. Love and that. I saw you just customized it out. Yeah. What are some of the coolest cars you have? You've had some Lamborghinis. I've never been a Lamborghini Oh, no, guy. Ferraris? No. Had a lot of Ferraris. Yeah. I love Ferraris. My worst Ferrari story is I got a uh, brand new, well, it's my best and my worst story, so- I go into the Ferrari dealership on Ventura Boulevard. 
I have uh, army boots on. Yeah. Super short shorts with a mushroom uh, patch tattooed where my dick is. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. And a bunch of chains and no shirt. You're going in with like the uh, with the Lemmy shorts. Yeah. Just the Daisy full, Dukes. Full Daisy Dukes. With a Dukes. mushroom over your dick. Yeah, that was me. And I blew in there. <laughs> yeah. And when I walked in, the ding, the door goes ding. And they look up and it's like, I remember it was really hot outside. It was so nice inside. I was like, oh, this is nice in here. Yeah. A guy from behind the desk goes, excuse me, can I help you? And I go, I want to buy a, a Testarossa if you have one. Oh, yeah. The guy goes, um, um, uh, excuse me, hold on. And he goes in the back. Yeah. And then another guy comes out. That's always bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other guy to throw you out. <laughs> and I or go, the filter. Yeah. And I go, he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm the manager here. Can I help you with something? I mean, maybe I thought I was homeless or something. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I want to buy a Testarossa. And he goes... Uh, do you know how much they are? And I said, well, I go, you guys are probably selling them above sticker price. I think they're 175 I think they're going for about 236 right now. I'll give you $225,000 cash. You have it? I got the cash. Yeah, cash. And the guy goes, uh, well, there's one in the back. And I think he still thinks I'm going to be taken away in a pet. So he goes in the back. It's yeah. a red one with tan. I go, that's exactly what I want. I'll take it. Wow. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, do you, can I take it now? And he goes, well, we, we have to prep it. I go, cool. I'm going to go get a hamburger and I'm going to come back. I'm going to drive it home. Yeah. And I came back and I had a brown paper bag. With 200, Br- brown paper bag. <laughs> Where did you go to the bank to get that? Uh-huh. And they would just give you the cash? It's my fucking money. I know, but you know how they are. They're like, um, you have to, we have to go to like four banks to get that. No, I took it and I bought <laughs> yeah. it in cash yeah. and um, I drove it home. What the guy did the guy shit his pants like I think when I drove off they, the all of them were standing on the curb yeah like it was like a scene out of a movie and they were like did that just happen <laughs> they had no idea yeah. who you were I heard that Slash, that happened to Slash, too. He went to the Porsche dealer in Beverly Hills. He goes in, crusty leathers, Slash, you know, yeah. uh, you know, illusion era Slash, okay. just garbage Slash. Yeah. He yeah. goes in there. And the guy goes, can I help you? And he goes, yeah, I want to get a twin turbo, 911. And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, and just walks by him, ignores him. Next guy walks by him, he goes, hey, I want to get a twin turbo, 911. And the guy's like, yeah, excuse me, sir. No one talking to him. Some guy that's the car washer guy that, that de- details him, yeah. goes, hey, you're Slash. He goes, yeah, man, I want, to get a, I want to get a Porsche twin turbo. And he goes and tells the guy, and the guy comes over. And he goes, oh, uh, sorry about that. And he goes, I want two, but only if this kid gets the commission. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I know, right? Did and he? the kid got the commission from what I hear, you That's know? Awesome. That could be a myth, but I love it, man. Yeah. What cars were your favorite? Uh, you Porsche guy? I'm a, I'm a 911 uh, freak. I've, I've been looking at Porsches again. Oh, God. Like, you got to get into the air-cooled 911. I... I uh, had a twin turbo. Yep. Lowered. Like the there was only this much rubber. Like, wow. Like an inch. It was the stupidest thing I ever did because I was always banging up the rims. Yeah. I put a biggest whale tail on it. Yeah. And it was the first time I had a Tiptronic. Oh yeah. And oh, I loved that car. But what happened was I drive a lot and I got really tired of being beat up in it. Oh yeah, because you're so low like a go kart. Yeah. Um. So. When that car went, uh, I ended up getting a Corvette. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, because I, I wanted a convertible. So I was like, I'm going to get the Corvette convertible. So I had that for about a year, and I loved it. Even though it's still a Corvette, it wasn't a Porsche, and I'd have a Ferrari, Testarossa as well, obviously. Um, and then I uh, and then I ended up with some... Uh, like a 32 Ford and then like a Chevelle, 70 Chevelle convertible. And I was like, I want to just like get back into a sports car convertible. And I bought a California, for our California. Oh, badass. I love those. Love that That's car. That's a great car. And I had that for a couple of years. <laughs> and I told the guy when I went in, I said, hey, um, when I want to get that car, it was a 458 Spider. I go, so I'm going to take this car. 
And then when the lease is halfway up, because I lease my cars, because yeah, I, t- I tell the government I drive them to work. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I'm going to come back, and you're going to give me the same car for this price. He goes, that's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. So I go in there with the car. It's yeah. all dirty. I haven't washed it. We go, hey, um, I'm thinking of extending my lease. Uh, get that car, and you can have me for two more years. Or I'm going to turn this car in, and I'm going to get a Porsche. Yeah. So I got the 458. Wow. So I drove that for a while. 458, great car. Great car. Wow. Love that car. And then um, I got the Jeep recently. Yeah. And now I'm looking at Porsches. So what do you want to get? Like vintage? Well, no. I want, oh, to get, I want to get brand new, Tiptronic, convertible. Yeah. What right. do you suggest I get? Targa. Something that I can, I mean, it's easy to drive. Yep. It's like comfortable. I need sound system. Yeah. I need I need to make my business calls. I need to listen to music. And I don't want to feel like I've gone to the races when I get, you know, to where yeah. I'm going. Targa S. Targa the, S. That the new Targa S is phenomenal. It's a, it's my favorite car because they've got the, the top target thing like your nine fourteen had. Yeah, yeah. The glass piece goes up like this. It goes down into the trunk and it's all sealed and primo. It's not like a shitty convertible yeah, where yeah. you can't see and it starts leaking. Yeah. And yeah. it's a beautiful body. It's got that metal piece yeah. in between the you know the roof and the glass. Yeah. And they come in the coolest colors, man. Like the that old seventies blue. I mean, the, could I do that? I mean, can I get a Away with that if I if I'm going in right now and you're yeah. like I know Nikki Six yep. and I'm 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 gonna pick his car for him yeah I'm like Dean I think I want a black one and you're like look I need you to think outside the box for a second. absolutely you're 58 years old you've done a lot of stuff you're wearing a flowered shirt right now yeah you can still rock the leathers yep what what's my color I go the fucking pink panther pink. I'm like gonna the, get beat up. I know nah, nah. Slash's house will beat me up. No way, man. Here's the thing. I just talked to Rogan about this. He goes, "Man, you like those wild colors, but those colors <laughs> they made, like you know, Miami blue. Yeah, they got one that's called mint green. It's like chocolate chip mint ice cream that's color. Nice. That is fuck. Those colors, they're all like those uh, Art Deco colors. Yeah. You know, yeah. Those things are way cooler than black to me. Because black is. Uh, I got a white Jeep. Because yeah. I just can't deal with the dirt. The dirt, I can't go it either. You, you know what's great about the 911? It always looks the same. Yeah. Except for the shit era, the 993, where they did these ugly headlights yeah. where it spills off to the side. Nobody wants that. But all the other ones from 60. 60- what's that cost now, the, a, new, a new one? A new one, like 130 See, in, compared to a Ferrari? Yeah, cheap. Yeah. And, and a state-of-the-art car, dude. I can, Gin. My co-host is sitting over there. Yeah. I could get two and give you one. Yeah. What color do I get? What colors she get? You should get army green. Yeah. Army she... green. Badass. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, Absolutely. I'm buying everybody them. Are you rich? Uh, no, I'm poor. <laughs> well, no, because I, I, I... My man, my manager. Yeah, because, you, you you know, you that tour was big money, right? Yeah. <clears throat> it was, what, a year and a half? But I, I, don't, I don't care about that kind of money. I understand that. Yeah. I understand that. But what I'm saying is... Um, you know, uh, you sign this thing, you're not going to ever tour as the crew again mm-hmm. or whatever. We've heard that a million times on every band. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, uh-oh, you know, the money's gone. But, you know, I watched recently the Minimalist documentary, and I, I try to get myself, but I watch you and you're exact to me. <clears throat> you're up late, and you, you Motley's gone. And you just start buying stuff, right? And you're filling houses, and you're going, guitar number 700, you got a bass here you brought, and you're just like me. You're the same fucking way. You go, this is the best bass I've ever owned. Yeah. I need to get four more. I'm the same way. I get a watch and I go, I yeah. love this. Yeah. I want to get the black face one yeah. now. Yeah, now yeah I wanna... I, I'm a watch guy. Yeah. You know... I don't even, my watch... <laughs> My watch, it says it's uh, it's 4 a.m. Yeah, yeah. I never even said it. <laughs> Why would I set it? I have a, I have a phone. It's just all about the the piece. But if I was smart for yeah. how much this Cartier solid gold, yeah, Santos XXL, yeah, they don't even make this. Yep. For what I paid for this, you know how much bling I could have. I know. I could make rappers look poor. Yeah. 
I mean, how stupid am I that I'm by a watch yeah. because of the guts and because of all that? It's a watch. Why did I do that? Why do I not just buy gold? Well, watches to me are a lot like vintage guitars. They're handmade. Yeah. They're fucking completely cool pieces of art, and they're uh, they're going to last way beyond us. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And they and there's something about a watch to me that I don't give a fuck about time. Yeah. But it, it's what went into it. It's mm-hmm. like a 59 junior like you got. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's what went into it. And, and and you know, there's not a lot of things that are handmade anymore. Yeah. You know? I love handmade stuff. Handmade shit's gone. Handmade knives. <laughs> so I have handmade I know. Knives. I love your knife photos. So you asked me about money? Yeah. Okay. So the best advice I ever got, and I will hand it out like candy. Yeah. Look at this. We're wrapping it up. Yeah. We're wrapping it up. Bring yeah. it back to the candy. Um, <laughs> if you make a dollar... And uh, in my case, I'm the 50% tax bracket. Okay? Yeah. And I have a manager. It costs me 15%. He's 15? 15. Wow. I've been with him for- um, Doc McGee? No, uh, Alan Kovac. I've been uh, with him for 23 years. Personal manager. Yeah, all my everything. Oh, I got you. Everything. So Doc didn't manage Motley Crue? He did in the early days, yeah. Oh, I got you. Early okay. Days. So um, I, I'm trying to think of a way to do this. So- I take 20% of my net, 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 and I never touch it. So if my, uh, I have to lose off the top 65 cents, let's just call it 60. So I have 40 cents left on a dollar. On every dollar you earn. Uh, 40 cents. But it costs me um, 30 cents to live. Right. I'm only putting 10% away. I'm only putting 10 cents for a dollar. I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. I 20% of everything I make. So whatever my life has to adjust to that. So I can have Porsches and Ferraris. I can have guitars. I can have candy. I can have anything I want. I have a stripper pole on my motorcycle, my trike. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Your trike with flames. But if, if, if I'm only putting 19% away, I'm an idiot. I have to save 20% of everything I do. And I've been doing that for as long as I know. And that 20% gets impacted and impacted and impacted. And I invest in California California municipal bonds because you get 5% non-tax return on that. So you make 5%. If you have a dollar in there, you make a nickel. Wow. And the next year, you make 5% on a dollar five. Right. And you do do that for 30 years. And, and it grows and it grows and it grows. And, and, and there's times in my life where like I go, man, I'd really like to do that, but I'm not touring and it, it's not going to work out 20%. And you will never have to worry again because when the rainy day comes and you're like, shit, you know that there's something that's growing over here. Yeah. It's the best, best thing you can ever do. And people don't do it. You've been doing that how long? As long as I can remember. Wow. Why do you live? You live in Calabasas, right? I did, and then I moved because of paparazzi. Where do you live now? I live out in Thousand Oaks. Why do all the rockers move out there? Do you ever feel like... I, I always felt like if I More made... because some... you've seen, like, the hunting dog on the porch. Yeah. We're hunting dogs. Yeah, yeah. On the porch. Our days are gone. <laughs> We're lucky if an old hunting dog comes by and we can hump her. Yeah. And maybe there's a bird off in the distance, and we're like... We see the bird and we like pretend to point and our owner's like, oh, good job, Nikki. <laughs> you, you have a, don't you ever feel like if I, if I lived in the Hollywood Hills still, I would be fully alive and, or, or, I'd be dead. or New York City? No, no. I'm, I'm out there. Yeah. And this is how I look at it. Okay. So, uh, big fish, small pond. Uh huh. I don't care. I'm married. Yeah. I'm monogamous. I'm loyal. I love my wife. But when I walk around Westlake, I still, they say that old, that a hunting dog. Uh, <laughs> they're like, there's Nikki Six. Nikki Six. That You're hun- hilarious. That hunting dog, he's a king. He's royalty. Yeah. It's awesome. I go into Hollywood. I got to compete with these young guys oh. and I got to kill them. I got to <laughs> kill them. I got to overdose and die so I can feel better about myself. So the only way to survive. Yeah is to uh, fake myself into believing I'm still, uh, you know, half in it. That's from being off, <laughs> that's from being off stage. You know what I mean? Because you still need that, hey, Nikki Six, right? Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean, right? Not me, but, <clears throat> no. you know, I, I like, uh, I, I'm kind of like, 
I'm a guy that like goes into his closet and like is like a scientist and comes up with stuff. And then I come out. Yeah. It's like, damn, I didn't see that coming or like recharge, have energy, feel good. And I can't do that when people are pecking at me all the time. So I have to um, put myself in a quiet area. Yeah. So then I can be creative. And then, and then, then I go into the world and I go do my stuff, you know. I want to write some songs with you. You don't want to write a song with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll just make want. You, I'll make you crazy. You'll be like, dude, I, I, the song's called Dog. You're like, the dog. Yeah. Like, okay, you gotta go back, you gotta go back. You can't stop at the dog. You have to. <laughs> you, I, to come, I need 500 pages about the dog. <laughs> <laughs> just w- If we ever write together, you just yeah. have to do what you do on stage. I'm there. Just I go for it. Let it flow. Oh, well, you know, I write now. Is no like, rhyming dictionary. Uh, no, I say run the track. I put the headphones on and I just start throwing it out. That's yeah. how I do there it. You go. And it's You're great. Freestyling. It co- yeah, it comes from somewhere else. You yeah, know what it I mean? Does come from All else. my records have been yeah. like, I've been fucked. I'm just strumming and then I yeah. go, there's a man on the highway. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean? But it's stuck. And then I just there write it. There he is. It. He's on yeah. the highway. You got a favorite comedian? You. Wow. Oh, <laughs> you got to come out again. Yeah. Oh, you I, tell me next time I'll be there. I will. Okay. Hey, dude, I can't thank you enough for Thanks. doing the show. Anytime. It's a total dream guest. I Thanks. could talk to you for hours. Thanks, son. And everybody's like, oh, fuck, this is great. Uh, I was thinking of doing stand-up <laughs> comedy. What do you think? You should do it. Just one time, two times. I would, I would get eaten for lunch. I'd go up and I'd say, fuck you guys. What are you fucking looking at? Yeah. And you're like, yeah, there he is. He's back. He's he's not Thousand Oaks anymore. You could do you could do storytellers like Rollins, though, because yeah. you got great fucking stories. Yeah. And, and you you know how to tell a story. He scares me now. I saw him in Germany or so. He was like sitting at a table eating by himself. And he's yeah. like old and he's just like, I'm like, I, don't, I, I wanted to go over and say, you know, hi, Henry. I don't know. Is it Mr. Rollins? Right. He's, and he made eye contact with me, and I felt ashamed. He's intense. Well, you know, I think he's, uh, what, he's what we wish we could be. He's at peace. He doesn't need items and stuff other than vinyl. And he could just travel around like a, just a, you know, like a soldier out there, man, with I, a backpack. I love him. I want guns and knives and yeah. por- a new Porsche I'm going to buy tonight. Yeah. yeah. And, I want to go with you when you get okay, it. we're going to go buy it. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, All right. bud. Thank you, man. There you guys go. Tune in, uh, tune in next week again to Let There Be Talk. And don't forget to leave a review and subscribe. Thank you, guys.